Everyone has used human population projections to argue one point or another. So it's about four and a half to five billion years old. Which means about half the hydrogen the sun is now being used up. There's no hope. How long would it take if we started with two people to get two six million people? There's too much stupid, 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 too much stupid, stupid, stupid. Nah, you're not done yet. I'm okay. Ugh. My mouth tastes like a swimming pool. Uh, grumble, 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 grumble. Uh, all right, Mark King, what else you got for us? First of all, your videos are overfilled with your ridiculous ad homonyms. Me truly thinks thou doth protest too much. Ha ha ha. Uh, hi, Pot. Meet Kettle. Your most common response to me has been to belittle my education and to contrast it with Surtees's. An ad hominem is literally your best argument. And after all that, what do you have to say to Doc Savage when he states that he has a PhD and yet he agrees with me? Well then both of us must have shitty fake degrees. You really can't get much more pathetic than that, Mark. With this amount of scientists who support the theory of evolution and the other topics discussed in my videos, do you really think all of them have diploma mill degrees? Besides, I did not make any ad hominem attacks. Yes, I called Surtees an idiot and a moron because he was being an idiot and a moron. But none of those insults substituted for arguments, so there were no ad hominems. That is just a lazy excuse ideologues use to dismiss the arguments they cannot defeat intellectually. They have no love in them. They have no love in them. So all the science and whatever gibberish you want to you want to spout at me, you don't have any love in you. You have no love in you. So it's all worthless. If you could just get to whatever point you think you are going to make, I might actually watch one of your stupid videos to the end. Anyway, you asked me to come here and comment on Dr. Surtzi's statements regarding the comet and the sun. First of all, in your introduction to this mess, you lie and say that Dr. Surtzi's offered human population projections as proof of a young Earth. That is a lie! He offered it as evidence! Or do that to even teach the difference between proof and evidence in that diploma mill you're attending. Smiley winky face! I... don't care. You cannot defend this argument. No matter how you spin it, there is no end to the stupid of the creationism population growth argument. Now can we please talk about something else? Now, onto your big refutation of Dr. Surtees' statements on comets and the sun. You brought me over here for this? You didn't refute a damn thing! You said exactly the same thing Dr. Surtees was saying, with the exception that you stated the ages of the comets were between a few years to hundreds of thousands of years. Whereas Dr. Surtees stated the ages from a few years to about a thousand years ON AVERAGE! No, he said... So the average life of a comet is only several thousand years, depending how often it comes past the sun. Something like Halley's Comet comes every 80 or so years. I was the one who said that the life expectancy of comets, at least the comets with irregular orbits that bring them into the inner solar system, can be a few years in just a single orbit, or hundreds of thousands of years in many orbits. Let us review exactly what Mark Surtees said in the original video. But after a while, it's going to actually all boil away and have nothing left. So the average life of a long period comet, not the short period comets, there's, a, there's another family of comets called the short period comets that go around very quickly in a couple of years rather than long period comets which go around maybe tens of hundred, uh, to hundred years. The average life is only going to be about a thousand years. So and why is the average life expectancy of short period comets one thousand years? Mm. What numbers does he use? Doesn't say. Who is he quoting? Beats me. Mark Surtees does have a point to this and I'll get back to that later. But what does Mark King have to say? 
Now, do they teach your dumbass anything about averaging numbers? I learned how to do it in elementary school. Anyway, I looked online and found a site which MIGHT be able to help you. I looked around till I found one I thought suitable to your educational level. Smiling winky face. The link he gave me is a website geared to teaching math to elementary school students. Cute. Anyway, the 1000 year average that Dr. Surtees gave was a mean or a median number. That is somewhere in the middle. Wait, which is it? A mean or median? Those are different things. Maybe you are the one who needs that website. But yet again, it does not matter. It makes no sense to find an average age for comets. Here is an analogy to explain why. The oldest crust on Earth is the 4.4 billion year old Jack Hills in Western Australia. The youngest crust on Earth is the 0.0 year old crust forming at the divergent tectonic plate boundary of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So I can plug these numbers into a very basic average equation and get an average crust age of 2.2 billion years. This is technically true on a very basic level. I can plug in a bunch of other crust ages from other places and this number becomes better. Instead of using middle school math, I could use high school math and weight these different sections of the crust with their proportion of the volume of the Earth's crust. But in the end, what the hell is the point? What is gained from this effort? It tells us nothing about geology and compares apples to oranges. The oceanic crust is dense and slips into subduction zones very easily. As such, oceanic crust has a much smaller range of ages than the continental crust and is a lot newer. And there is a wide variety of geological processes that affect different parts of the Earth in different ways. This average tells us nothing. NOTHING! Likewise, it is utterly useless to compare comets of different sizes, orbits, and origins to come up with an average age. So why is Surtees doing it? Because it supports his narrative. Or at least he thinks it does. An astronomer by the name of Oort got around the problem by saying, well actually we've, he suggested the Oort cloud is a source of the long period comets. You have a diagram of what he th thinks the Oort cloud looks like. And out to about one light year, you have what's called the Oort cloud. It's basically a cloud of comet sized objects in a spherical shell around the sun. And every now and then, a passing star just perturbs the gravitational field slightly and one of these comets drops in towards the sun, so they can come from any direction. You need a constant source of these comets because they only last for a few thousand years maximum. But it's never actually been observed. It's a very interesting phenomenon and some astronomers have made a comment in, in the scientific literature that here we have an object that's never been observed or a phenomenon that's never been observed which is cited in the literature over and over again to explain the, the origin of comets. So is that scientific? Well, not very. What a pile of crap. Okay, here's how this creationist believes the idea of the Oort cloud came about. No, oh, gee, these comets would only last a few thousand years. How can we possibly explain them without saying God did it 6,000 years ago? Duh, let's just assume that there's a big sphere of comets that keeps supplying new ones. We'll also claim that it is too far to see, so they won't ask for us for proof. Great, evolution's been saved again. Yay! Now, you state the high-end ages of comets can be hundreds of thousands of years. How? Exactly. Do you know this? Being only 23 years of age, you have not even observed 100 years, let alone a thousand or 100,000. What? You think I cannot possibly know about something unless I was personally alive to witness it? Well, then I might ask. Now you might ask, and reasonably so. How does Dr. Surtees know they last on average 1,000 years? Oh, yes, I would. Especially since the comets were formed at the beginning of the solar system 5 billion years ago. But I assume he starts the clock when they are first documented as having entered into the inner solar system. It took thousands of years before people were able to identify that Halley's Comet was the same object that was recorded by civilizations as early as 240 BCE. Halley's Comet is actually the only comet regularly seen from Earth with the naked eye, 
and it was not until 1705 that it was discovered to be the same object returning in a predictable interval. When I first made these two videos so long ago, I attempted to trace back Mark Surtees' math and reveal exactly where he went wrong, like what I did with the population growth argument. But I honestly have no idea how he even got this number. I cannot find any facts or measurements he could have misinterpreted to come up with it. And considering his admitted ignorance in astronomy, I can only conclude that either he or whoever he copied this from pulled it out of their ass. By something we call RECORDS! Comets have been recorded since ancient history. We also have comets that have been seen and later seen again, i.e. Halley's and hale -Bop. Therefore, THANKS TO RECORD KEEPING from the ancients till now. Eh? What the? Did you not just say? Now, you state the high-end ages of comets can be hundreds of thousands of years. How? Exactly, do you know this? Being only 23 years of age, you have not even observed 100 years, let alone a thousand or 100,000. This is the fastest I have ever seen someone refute themselves. Why would you even say... <laughs> you know what? Never mind. Yes, that is how I know the orbital period of different comets. In addition, the long period comets with orbits of thousands of years tend to come into the inner solar system at random angles. Hmm. Almost as if their affilians exist in some spherical region one to three light years around the sun. Hmm. Maybe we should call this something. Like, I don't know, how about the Oort Cloud? Why not? Just because. Dr. Surti's comments are based on OBSERVATION and EXTRAPOLATION, whereas your estimates are based on nothing more than SCIENCE FICTION! Smiling winky face! The problem Dr. Surtees talks about is also one NOT LOST on astronomers espousing naturalism. Or DO YOU KNOW WHY THE THEORY OF THE OORT CLOUD WAS DEVELOPED? Smiley winking face? My guess is that you do not. Yes, actually I do. I said so in my original video. Here's how the theory of comets has developed. It goes back to nebular theory. Nebular theory, when it was first contrived, fit well with what was observed at the time, such as the division of the two types of planets, terrestrial planets in the inner solar system and Jovian planets further out, and why nearly all of the mass of the solar system orbits and rotates in the same direction. It also explained why the asteroids in the asteroid belt are quite old and organized between Mars and Jupiter. Comets are made mostly of hydrogen compounds, i.e. methane, ammonia, water, etc. These compounds cannot solidify in the vicinity of the terrestrial planets. Therefore, they must have formed near the gas giants. The high gravity of these planets would have kept the comets from becoming very large. And nebula theory predicted that the further comets would have been pushed into a belt beyond the orbit of Neptune. And starting in 1992, what was discovered? A large band of comet-like objects in orbit around the sun beyond the orbit of Neptune. A huge discovery in favor of nebula theory. The nebula theory also predicts that the comets that formed closer to Jupiter would have been flung out in many different directions. Some achieved es escape velocity and continued to drift away into interstellar space. Billions of them, however, would remain in a roughly spherical field at a great distance from the rest of the solar system, known as the Oort Cloud. The oddly tilted orbits of the known long-period comets are statistical proof of the existence of the Oort Cloud. In the same manner as the Kuiper Belt was predicted before it was ever observed, it is almost certain that once our astronomical observation technology advances far enough, we will have visual proof of the Oort Cloud. The small icy planetesimals are too small and far away to be observed visually. We can detect members of the Kuiper Belt in the scattered disk, but that's the only place left for creationists like you to hide your god, isn't it? It is not enough that the geological, chemical, radiological evidence points to a solar system that is billions of years old. The fact that we cannot see the affilians of the long period comets is enough for you to pretend we do not have this abundance of evidence and a model that fits all of our observations. Because if we do not know everything, therefore we do not know anything and you are free to make up whatever fairy tale suits you. Indeed. You are the one who continually demonstrates a lack of knowledge of science. But since I am feeling generous, I will go ahead and give you the answer. The theory of the Oort Cloud and the existence of this thing is yet UNPROVEN was developed as an answer to the very problems that Dr. Surtees was talking about. 
So even secular astronomers knew that this was a problem for their assumption that the universe was 13 billion years old. LOL! My recommendation, young man, is that you study the history of science before you make the assumption that you know more than someone who has already attained their doctorate. You clearly do not know as much about science as you would like to make people believe. Smiling Winky Face. Your own sources support everything I've said here and in my original videos. The 1,000 or multi-thousand year average age comes from nothing. We have seen comets collide with the Sun and Jupiter, but we have never observed the comet completely degas. Halley's Comet has a predicted life expectancy of another 10,000 years, provided it is not perturbed by the gravity of one of the planets into colliding with the planet or the Sun, or being ejected from the solar system. Although hard to see, astronomers have found a substantial number of Kuiper Belt objects. There is no shortage of short period comets, and their existence is entirely consistent with having been formed nearly 5 billion years ago after the beginning of the solar system. There is no need to invent a nebulous pseudoscientific source of comets, because if the Oort cloud did not exist, it would have no effect on the short period comets. The Oort cloud is an explanation for the origin of the long period comets. The ones like hale -Bopp, that only appear in increments of thousands of years and enter the inner solar system from angles far outside the plane of the solar system. Your conspiracy solves a problem that simply does not exist. Even if we never developed the technology to visually see the Oort cloud, it would not change everything else we know about the solar system. And it especially would not change the age of the universe, which began nearly 8 billion years before our solar system accreted. <sighs> well, that was... sad. I said earlier that I would return to Mark King's constant criticism of my education and his frequent comparisons of my credentials to those of creationists he likes. Before anyone starts writing comments reminding me, yes, I know, that is the argument from authority fallacy. The reason this fallacy is so effective at convincing people to buy into stupid crap is because in our daily lives, an argument from authority is usually correct. We listen to our doctors and our mechanics for advice. The problem is, it is not an academic argument. Even worse, deferring to these conspiracy theorists and pseudoscience pushing con artists is not just argument from authority, it is an argument from bad authority or fake authority. I have a bachelor's of science and Dr. Surtees and Dr. Morris do have legitimate PhDs. Graduate level degrees are hard work, and I commend them for that accomplishment. But graduating college is not the crowning achievement of a scientist's career. They are much, much more than just the pieces of paper they mount on their walls. In truth, that is just the beginning of their education. Once they graduate, they must continue to build their reputation as competent researchers by working in labs and in the field. They must strengthen the skills they learned in school, but most importantly, they must learn new skills. It's the age-old balance of experience and education. Dr. Surtees' doctoral thesis is called The Hormonal Control of Seasonal Breeding of the Gray Squirrel. Now, if I ever want to know more about gray squirrels and the hormonal control of their breeding season, Dr. Surtees might be a good source for more information. But what has he done lately? If I search for publications of some random scientist, someone who finished his PhD 10 years after Dr. Surtees, I find a rich publication history full of papers that cover a variety of topics and expand our understanding of chemistry and have applications for industrial purposes and even medical purposes. Now, this totally random scientist named Dr. Mason has a PhD in some sort of polymer chemistry that is over my head. However, his career has brought him around the world and expanded his knowledge and skill set to qualify him to work in places like nuclear power plants and particle accelerators. When I search for publications by Dr. Surtees, I find just three publications made during his entire 35 years as a scientist. The other two were written by other scientists, and he was peripherally involved. Unlike Dr. Mason, Dr. Surtees' papers have rarely ever been cited which means what little he has produced was deemed by the scientific community to have no value. Hell, my own video is one of the first results on Google when you search his name. 
And when I search for articles by other PhD creationist scientists, the results are just as breadth of accomplishment, just a smattering of similarly useless publications. Yes, Dr. Surtees has a PhD. Yes, I only have a bachelor's degree. But that does not automatically make him right. That does not even make him smarter than me or more learned than me, especially on topics that are not related to his degree program. And I was an astronomy major before switching to computer engineering, so that makes me more educated on comments than Surtees. Frankly, one of my strongest memories in my one-on-one -on -one discussion with Surtees in the email chain was how odd it felt to talk to someone who seemed to have a much poorer understanding of science than I did while knowing that he had a PhD in a scientific field. Scientists of all varieties are what drive the advancement of civilization. We only remember the names of a very small number of them, but it is the unsung bulk that are primarily responsible for inching us ever forward. And that is the real tragedy of people like Mark Surtees. After all the work they spent finishing their degrees, they earned the right to join the ranks of their generation of scientists and, in at least a small way, contribute to the greater knowledge of mankind. But they squandered it. They were so entrenched in an ideology that they were willing to sacrifice their integrity and instead wasted their lives and this grand opportunity. The sad fact is, in this stelliferous world, full of scientific achievers who have spent their lives painstakingly unraveling the secrets of the universe, shining the way forward, making each generation smarter than the last, and paving the way for even more discoveries and more achievements that further improve our lives and expand our opportunities. In this universe, Mark, the people who you admire are brown dwarfs, dim and practically invisible non-achievers whose careers were stillborn and fizzled out before they began. Find yourself some better heroes, Mark. Take care.